hello guys can you hear my voice and uh, hello Hello guys, can you hear my voice? Can you please confirm? Hello. Hello, uh, can you hear my voice? Can you please confirm? Is my voice audible? Hello. 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 What is happening? Is my voice audible? Hello. What is this? Oh. Hello. Oh, where is the problem? My sound is working. It's all right. Hello. Is my voice audible? Hello. What is the problem? Okay, yeah. So uh, you can hear my voice, right, Tithi? Why am I not getting the sound here? Okay. So just let us start. I want more confirmation. Okay, can you hear me?
hello mm, i'm getting a warning here what's the warning resolution mm, okay i'm getting problem here uh, let me share some problem is I'm facing some problem but what is the what the issue is okay so uh, what I'm typing that I'm getting here Hello, can you hear my voice? Hello, is my voice audible to you? Hello guys, can you hear my voice? Okay, okay. So done. Okay, take him. Yes, let's go. So let me start with the topic today. Uh, here we are going to see uh, the uh, the drugs which is acting on the CNS, and uh, that is one of the most important topics. See, uh, in the GPET, uh, the CVS, CNS, ANS, endocrine. These are the four major chapters that you should not skip. Right. CNS, CVS, endocrine, and ANS. These are the four major topics that we should not skip. And uh, so today we are going to see uh, these few most important points from the CNS. So let us start with this. So the first one we are going to talk about the alcohol. So the, we are not going to study the whole alcohol chapter, but yes, there are few drugs which is being used to 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 prevent uh, uh, the toxicities of the methanol or to uh, to avoid the chronic alcohol poisoning and uh, so we have one drug here that is called as disulfiram and disulfiram is a drug which is being used to to prevent the alcohol or chronic alcoholism see how it is working so here we need to remember the mechanism of disulfiram so disulfiram is a drug which is inhibiting this enzyme called as aldehyde dehydrogenase which is an important enzyme playing a role into the metabolism of alcohol. Alcohol is being metabolized by the two enzymes. Number one is alcohol dehydrogenase and number two is the aldehyde dehydrogenase. So here the disulfiram is inhibiting this enzyme that is aldehyde dehydrogenase and because of that the acetaldehyde which is a metabolite of the ethanol could not further metabolize into the into the acidic acetic acid and that is why this acetaldehyde get accumulated and that is causing the unpleasant symptoms so here what we have to do is we here we have to remember the only one phrase what is that the that phrase is disulfiram is the aldehyde dehydrogenase inhibitor what is this aldehyde dehydrogenase inhibitor and it is used in the treatment of chronic alcoholism right there are other drugs as well which is also being used for the same condition the number one is a disulfiram that is true other than that we can also use the naltrexone which is an opioid antagonist that can be used to prevent the craving of alcohol see these all four drugs that are mentioned here the naltrexone acamprosate the endansetron and topiramate these all four drugs they prevent the craving and can be used for the same purpose they are also being used in the treatment of chronic alcoholism or to leave the alcohol right that is the purpose why we are using it 
and the naltrexone opioid antagonist ondansetron that we all know that is anti emetic drug by working by inhibiting the 5 h3 receptor acamprosid that is a gaba a receptor agonist topiramet which is also an anti epileptic drug that is working for the stimulation of gaba a receptor so here you have to remember the total five names which are the the number one is a disulfiram number two is a naltrexone number three is a acamprosid number four is an ondansetron number five is a topiramet so these are the five drugs which is used in the prevent in the chronic alcoholism okay there are other drugs as well who are not being used there but they produces the similar symptoms like a disulfiram like like the number one the most important drug is metronidazole it's an anti amoebic drug if you give the metronidazole to the person who is a chronic alcoholic user the drug is working uh, that metronidazole it is inhibiting the aldehyde dehydrogenase and it is producing the acetaldehyde uh, accumulation syndrome that is called as a aldehyde syndrome right acetaldehyde syndrome so the metronidazole it is it is being avoided in the patient who is an alcoholic user the same mechanism is applied to all the other drugs which i mentioned here griseofulvin sefuperazone chlorpropamide chlorpropamide is actually an first generation anti diabetic drug that was a sulfonylurea but that is not now used nowadays so you can skip this as well right chlorpropamide it was it was mentioned in the book but however it is withdrawn from the market so you can leave it uh, but these three drugs you have to remember right cefoperazone we all know that is a cephalosporin visofulvin is an antifungal drug and metronidazole it is an anti amoebic drug these all three drugs that is also inhibiting the inhibiting the aldehyde dehydrogenase yes aldehyde aldehyde dehydrogenase and that is why they inhibit the conversion of acetaldehyde into the acetic acid and produces the disulfiram like reaction so if you been asked a question which of the following drug is being avoided into the chronic alcoholic user the answer is metronidazole that produces the acetaldehyde syndrome so you have to watch the drug next methanol poisoning what is the treatment for the methanol poisoning right we all know that the ethanol is being used for drinking purpose ethanol is being used for drinking purpose but someone who is having the adulterant in the alcohol and uh, that uh, because of some fermentation abno uh, fermentation uh, problem uh, methanol is being produced in it and if someone drinks that methanol what would happen the methanol will causes the some toxicities and the major toxicity with the methanol is causing the blindness and leading to the respiratory failure and coma and death of the person so methanol poisoning what are the treatments so those patient who has got the methanol poisoning the ethanol is being given to them why because the ethanol and methanol they are may both metabolized by the same enzyme so when you give the ethanol to the person who is have taken the methanol the competition in the metabolism will occur and because of that the metabolism methanol will be slowed down and that is the reason why we give the methanol why we give the ethanol to the person who has have the methanol toxicity another one is the fomepizole this is the another important drug this is an antidote for what this is an antidote for methanol poisoning what is the name fomepizole you should remember this name fomepizole so in this slide the fomepizole is uh, is a hot drug what is how it is working so it is working by inhibiting the enzyme called as alcohol dehydrogenase see i have discussed there are two enzymes which is involved into the alcohol metabolism the number one is alcohol dehydrogenase number two is an acetaldehyde dehydrogenase so in this fomepizole it is it is an alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor so okay okay if you been asked who is the aldehyde dehydrogenase in aldehyde dehydrogenase inhibitor what is that the answer is disulfiram and if you been asked who is alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor the answer is fomepizole fomepizole right so fomepizole is one of the important drug here okay next the leucovorin what is the leucovorin leucovorin is an active form of the folic acid it is also called as folinic acid folinic acid that is for to improve the metabolism so calcium leucovorin it is a uh, it's a uh, is an active form of the Uh, active form of the folic acid, which is also called as folinic acid, or you can call also call it as a tetrahydrofolate. So there are three names of that same drug: leucovorin, yeah, the folinic acid, yeah, fit. That is also known as the tetrahydrofolate. 
So this is all about the alcohol. In this alcohol, we will remember about the disulfiram. We'll we'll also see the drugs which is used in the chronic alcoholism. So I mentioned five drugs which are being used there in the chronic alcoholism. Other than that, there are few drugs which is producing the disulfiram-like reaction where the metronidazole is the most important drug and you should remember it. Then we also talked about the methanol toxicity treatment. The methanol toxicity is being treated by the three drugs. The number one is ethanol by giving the ethanol which reduces the metabolism. Number two is a formepizole which is an alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor. Number three is a leucovorin which is a folic acid, active form of folic acid, right? It is also known as folinic acid or it is also known as tetrahydrofolate. Okay, so that is all about the alcohol. Now let's come to the benzodiazepines. It is one of the most important category from the chapter called as sedative and hypnotics, right? We we studied this sedative and hypnotics in a semester four in B farm. So this is a, one of the most important and most widely used category in the sedative and hypnotic. That is called as benzodiazepines. Now, if, what is the question they are being asking? They are being asking which is a which is the shortest acting benzodiazepine, which is the longest acting benzodiazepine. See, if you have been asked barbiturate, which is the shortest acting or which is called as ultra short acting barbiturate, the answer is what? Thiopentone, right? Thiopentone, that is also, that is being used for the short term surgeries and it is providing the anesthesia of around 15 to 20 minutes. So, here we have to remember the drugs of this benzodiazepine category based on the duration. So, in the short acting, we have only two that is midazolam and triazolam. And long acting, we have these four drugs, which is a clodiazepoxide, chlorazepam, diazepam, and fluorazepam. So, we will not remember the intermediate because what we will do is we will remember this six name, the two names from here and the four names from here, the six names we will remember, and another all the drugs that would be we will put it into the intermediate category. So, we are not going to remember everything. What we are remembering is we are remembering the two in shortest acting which is amidazolam and triazolam. We are remembering the four names from the longest acting that is clodiazepoxide, chlorazepam, diazepam and fluorazepam and remaining all that we will put into the intermediate duration. So that would how you can remember this. Based on the onset, yes, onset, who is the fastest acting benzodiazepine? The answer is home. The answer is this is the, the diazepam, triazolam, fluorazepam and chlorazepam. So these are the fastest acting, which is which is the delayed acting. Delayed acting, which is taking more than three years. So this is one called as it's having the longest or delayed onset. The answer is oxazepam, right? While intermediate, everyone is in in this category. So here also we are remembering the the longest one, the more than three year, and the shortest one, which is taking less than one hour. So these are the drugs which is having the fast onset diazepam, triazolam, fluorazepam and fluorazepam while the oxazepam is having the delayed onset, delayed onset right and everything other than that that comes into the category of intermediate. So that is about the benzodiazepines. Uh, the important thing is about the benzodiazepines that I have just pointed out some important things that you should remember. Example is the potency which is a more potent see, Potency and efficacy, these are the two important words that we've studied into the pharmacodynamic. When you when you ask about the efficacy, efficacy means it is also is it is all is always in terms of the effect, which is more effective, right? Someone is having the hundred percent effect, someone is having eighty percent effect, someone is having ninety percent effect. So those drugs which which is having the maximum effect is called as most efficacious. But when we call it about the potency, the potency is always in terms of the dose of the drug, dose of the drug, the drug which is requiring very less dose, right, very less dose that is more potent. So these are the drugs which is highly potent, highly potent means these are the drugs which requires the lowest dose of the drug, right, in terms of quantity, in terms of milligram, right, ultrazolam 0.25 milligram, 0.125 milligram. 0.5 milligram so these are the very small doses and that is why they are called as high potent right high potent which are the highly potent drugs so we have the three highly potent benzodiazepines which are the ultrazolam clonazepam and triazolam the another important thing is 
which benzodiazepines they does not have their active metabolite see most of the benzodiazepines they have their active metabolite and the diazepam is one of the biggest drug which is having their 20 or 15 metabolites that con con consecutive 15 metabolites are being active but here well here in the in the uh, here what we are remembering is we are remembering the benzodiazepines that is not containing any active metabolite means except they are active but their metabolites are inactive how do we remember it so we can remember it by remembering the name or acronym is a clone t t c c l o n that is clone and t t that is temazepam triazolam so clonazepam lorazepam oxazepam nitrazepam temazepam and triazolam these are the six drugs which does not have their active metabolite okay another thing is all the benzodiazepines are taken orally means all other all other benzodiazepines are available into the oral doses form but the only midazolam which is not available orally this is this is not available orally not available orally see here you might have some confusion like diazepam is also available in so many doses form the diazepam is available in the rectal uh, suppositories it is available into the into the iv formula as well but here what i want i mean is the meaning is the midazolam is the only one which is not available orally and it is being taken compulsorily through the parenteral route while the diazepam we have the diazepam oral diazepam also available so that is the reason why I, I i kept here right it is it is it is amidazolam which is not available into the oral formula it is only available into the parenteral doses form benzodiazepines should be avoided in the situations like the depression and the psychosis that they because they potentiate or worsen the situation uh, this is another important question for the g paid what is this this is our antidote whose antidote and it antidote for the benzodiazepine toxicity if the benzodiazepine toxicity occurs what would be the uh, what would be the solution of that the answer is what the answer is flumazenil flumazenil it's a benzodiazepine antagonist and can be given into the situation where the toxicity of benzodiazepine occurs so flumazenil this is an antidote right this is an antidote used in the benzodiazepine toxicity it is given through the intravenous route it is not available orally what is the problem with it the problem with this is it's uh, having the high first pass metabolism this is the reason why we cannot give this formula orally and uh, that is being given through the intravenous if you've been asked which benzodiazepine can be given into the pregnant lady the answer is what the answer is lorazepam and oxazepam lorazepam and oxazepam the, the advantage we, we with the lorazepam and oxazepam is they don't have the active metabolite and their secretion into the breast milk is limited that is the purpose why we we can give these molecules to the pregnant lady the monitoring parameter for this is the liver function test and the cbc that is a complete blood count that is all about the benzodiazepines benzodiazepines is one of the important thing and the probability of asking the question from this benzodiazepine is more right okay now let's come to the next point is the anesthetics so here we are going to talk about the general anesthetics that can be given by the two different routes and which are they the two different routes are the either they can be given through the parenteral or they can be given through the inhalational route right benzodiazepines can be given through the uh means we have the benzodiazepines here uh that that is a that is being given through the parenteral but there are two categories one is through inhalational and another is through parenteral inhalational we have the volatile liquids available and that is being given through the uh, pump that is volatile liquids it includes uh, all the fluorinated uh, molecules like uh, halothane isoflurane desflurane sevoflurane ether they are being uh, have they are the in form of liquid and but they are converted into the gases and are being given while the gaseous we have the only nitrous oxide which is most widely used and the cheapest uh, gaseous anesthetic that being used into the dental surgeries right nitrous oxide which is also called as laughing gas 
while parenteral formula we have the inducing agent and and the slow acting agent inducing agent means which is having very fast onset and can induce the anesthesia immediately right the propofol etomidate the thiopentone methahexitone while the, this with these later two molecules they are from the benzoda barbiturates category while the slow acting the ketamine benzodiazepines and opioids they are slow acting but they can be used into the maintenance of anesthesia see the which benzodiazepines are widely used for the for the anesthetic purpose the most widely used are the diazepam lorazepam and midazolam midazolam which is an short, which is having the short duration diazepam is having the longer duration lorazepam is having the intermediate duration lorazepam is having the another advantage it is producing the amnesia that right? it is producing the amnesia amnesia means what it is a short term memory loss and that's the purpose why why it can be given to the patient who is having also the agitation right those patient who is mentally mentally agitated in that case we can give the lorazepam to 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 produce the short term memory loss during that period right that lorazepam is being given what about the opioids which opioids are being given the opioids fentanyl fentanyl is one of the most potent opioid it's a synthetic and the most potent right most efficacy is most potent that is fentanyl then alfentanyl sulfentanyl remifentanyl these are the other uh, derivatives of it they can be given for controlling the pain uh, the another are the propofol etomidate that we have seen in the in inducing agent what is the mechanism the mechanism is they are gaba receptor agonist thiopentone and methahexitone they are barbiturates and ketamine ketamine which is a slow acting agent which is an nmda receptor antagonist NMDA that is N methyl D aspartate. Whose receptor is this? These are the receptor for the glutamate, right? So ketamine is a glutamate receptor antagonist. Glutamate receptor, the main receptor for the glutamate is which is, is the NMDA. There are three receptors for the glutamate that is NMDA, AMPA, and kinate, right? The NMDA receptor antagonist. This is a if a mechanism of ketamine. So here this is this is very uh, very simple topic, and uh, I think very few questions is being asked from this topic so the probability of asking a question is very less from this topic but however what we need to do is we need to remember the classification and we have to understand the mechanism see what i told you earlier the thing is you could not skip or you should not skip any topic from the pharmacology if you want to skip any topic you have to do the do the classification and the mechanism of that particular topic that you are going to skip right we completely we could not skip any topic but what we will do is we'll will if you are interested maybe this topic is not in my my uh, era right in that case you can just do the classification understand the mechanism done that okay so that's about the general anesthetic now let's come to the epilepsy yes epilepsy what is epilepsy epilepsy we know that it is it is the involuntary contraction of the skeletal muscle or we can also call it as a re, it is a recurrent seizures recurrent episodic seizure that is called as the epilepsy the reason behind the epilepsy is what in the epilepsy or brain right the patient who is having the epilepsy is brain get over activated and fire the impulses continuously right uh, if if we say okay, in the normal situation in the normal situation if your brain is uh, in the normal condition like if we are taking the example that's not a perfect situation but in, if in the normal condition if your brain fires the 500 impulses and that 500 impulses are being replied by the skeletal muscles in and you are in the normal situation right so skeletal muscles can respond the 500 impulses per minute right we are taking the example of it but if the someone who is having the epilepsy, his brain, his or her brain is firing like the 5 lakh impulses is a lot, many amount, right? So suppose his or her brain is firing like 5 lakh impulses per minute. And in that case, our skeletal muscles could not control this number of impulses. And because of that, the involuntary contraction of the skeletal muscle occurs. And this leads to the convulsion. Why the convulsion occurs? The convulsion occurs because of the excessive firing of the brain. When your brain is not in your control and it fires a lot many impulses which your skeletal muscle could not handle, in that case the epilepsy occurs. So the convulsion, it will occur when the firing of the impulses, it occurs through the very high speed 
and your skeletal muscle could not could not handle that that is the reason why it is happening so what what are the basic reason behind that see the we all know that our our cell or our neuronal cell is having the having the negative voltage in the normal resting condition when our cell is relaxing that is called as normal resting potential which is having the voltage of minus 70 to minus 90 millivolt right this is a normal resting potential and when our brain is get activated it is always occurred because of the opening of the sodium channel ya to fir opening of this t type of calcium channel and because of that the positive charge occurs inside the cell and that leads to the that that leads to the firing of impulse so the impulse firing would occur only when these positive channels are open kaun si positive channel the sodium and calcium so when these channels get open the sodium get in calcium get in these are the positive ions because of that the voltage of cell that is what is normal is the minus 70 to minus 90 that would come to the positive and because of that depolarization occurs and that leads to the firing of impulse so what we can do we can block this so here we have the we have the mechanism see this diagram is indicating the mechanism so the ultimately problem is what the ultimately problem is that the sodium channels are getting over activated so what we will do we will give the drugs that causes the inactivation of the sodium channel what is another problem the calcium channel get activated what can we do we can block the block the calcium channel so these are the drugs which is acting on this calcium channel these are the drugs which is blocking the sodium channel so which are the sodium channel blockers so phenytoin carbamazepine valproate lamotrigine tomipramate jonisamide lecosamide these all are the sodium channel blockers and that is how they are they are inhibiting the depolarization what they are doing is they are inhibiting the depolarization ab depolarization nahi hoga there would be no impulse and if there would be no impulse this is how they can block the conversion so conversion is occurring because of the higher number of impulses so what we are doing is we are controlling the we are controlling the number of impulses and that is how the conversion is being treated so these are the mechanisms sodium channel blocker calcium channel blocker which are the calcium channel blocker ethosuximide see valproate is having the both effect sodium channel blocker as well as t type of calcium channel blocker jonisamide is having also the dual mechanism right jonisamide valproate they have the sodium channel blocking effect as well as they are also blocking the blocking the calcium channel see another is what we have certain drugs that open the calcium channel sorry chlorine channel not a calcium they are chlorine channel openers how this chlorine channel openers work they open the chlorine channel chlorine is more in outside the neuron so when this calcium channel chlorine channel opens the chlorine will get in and because of that the voltage of a cell which was minus 70 or minus 90 that would become more negative and because of that they repolarize that is not a repolarization but that could as hyperpolarization occurs which is more negative voltage inside the neuron and because of that the chances of impulse generation would be reduced so these are chlorine channel openers they are not blockers right so we have only three category of drugs here based on the mechanism i'm not seeing or i'm not showing you the uh, classification like the which are hydantoin which are barbiturates which are benzodiazepines i'm not showing you the mechan chemical classification here what i'm showing you is i'm showing you the anti epileptic drugs based on the mechanism of action number 1 sodium channel blocker number 2 calcium channel blocker number 3 chlorine channel openers this is how you can correlate right barbiturates benzodiazepines vigabatrin valproate gabapentin tiagabine these all are ultimately opening the chlorine channel via via gaba right so they are they are stimulating the gaba effect and because of that the chlorine channel get open and because of this chlorine channel open the voltage of the cell that becomes hyperpolarized and that is the reason why there would be no impulse right or impulse generation would be reduced impulse generation would be reduced and this is how this drug would work in the epilepsy so yaha pe is slide mein you have to just remember the concept that there are three category of drugs that can work in the epilepsy calcium channel blocker sodium channel blocker and chlorine channel openers and these are the list of drugs that you can remember okay next this is another important thing okay, which drug is a first choice first choice if 
the particular type of seizure is present like someone who is having the partial seizure what would be the first choice so the answer is levetiracetam phenytoin carbamazepine ya to lamotrigine you can take a one drug from this category and that can help to control the partial seizure so these are the first choices right these are the first choices so levetiracetam phenytoin carbamazepine lamotrigine these are the first choice when the patient is having the partial seizure if the patient is having absence seizure then the answer is ethosuximide this is the only drug right ethosuximide that would not be uh, that would not come anywhere that would be only in, given into the absence seizure absence seizure it's a seizure which would occur mostly on the children's only right it is it is more common into the children it is more common into the children so in this absence seizure the base or first choice is what ethosuximide ethosuximide this is the only drug here you cannot find this drug in anywhere else and that would be given this another option is valproate ethosuximide ethosuximide another option is valproate okay uh, this is absence seizure is most common into the children right absence seizure it is found into the children okay then adult ma in the adult the grand mal seizure is most common the grand mal seizure that is more common into the adult and the option are the phenytoin carbamazepine valproate lamotrigine and levetiracetam so we have lot many options for this grand mal seizure yes then myoclonic the answer is valproate atonic the answer is valproate see valproate is one of the most common drug which is given in majority of the situation so it means what if you know don't know the answer the probability of getting valproate right answer is more valproate see whatever types we have written here we have written the five types of seizures and in that in major, in four types the valproate is being given while here in a partial seizure valproate is not in a first line therapy but yes valproate can be given as a second choice when the first line therapy is not working but here i'm i'm just mention the first choices right first choices so this table is important for us and uh, remember the the drugs based on the type of seizures okay so this is all about the epilepsy now we we see the certain important drugs like the phenytoin is more important valproate is more important and carbamazepine so we are going to see the few important things about these three drugs so let us start with the phenytoin phenytoin is actually a narrow therapeutic index drug phenytoin is having the two important parameter that you should understand the number one when the concentration of phenytoin reaches about 10 mcg that is microgram per ml then the risk of the toxicity is increased why because it follows the zero order kinetic and when it the concentration goes beyond this the metabolism gets saturated and the risk of toxicity would high so above this concentration the metabolism gets saturated and because of that the toxicity risk is high okay then the another important thing is it is an enzyme inducer phenytoin yes enzyme inducer so let's see uh have here what we will do is we will remember about about the the uh the adverse effects and this adverse effect you can you can you can uh remember by the by the name or uh, by the alphabets of the phenytoin itself so p p stands for it's a potent inducer right it's a potent inducer of many cyp enzyme uh it's a potent inducer of many cyp enzymes including cyp3 a4 cyp2d6 cyp2c9 to c19 in most almost all the cyp enzymes get induced induced means what induced means they increases the amount they increases the synthesis of this cyp enzymes and because of that the metabolism of the other drugs which is metabolized by this cyp enzymes get increased and that is why the toxicity or effect of the drug is get reduced so it is an inducer inducer means what inducer means it increases the synthesis of this cyp enzymes next h hirsutism hirsutism is what it's an excessive hair growth then e that is enlarged gum which is also called as gingival hyperplasia what is another name of this gingival hyperplasia okay then n n stands for nystagmus nystagmus means what it is an involuntary movement of eyeballs then y that is yellow 
और ब्राउनिंग ऑफ द स्किन टी टेराटोजेनिक ओ ऑस्टियोमलेशिया ऑस्टियोमलेशिया मीन्स इज अ सॉफ्टनिंग ऑफ बोन बिकॉज ऑफ द डिक्रीज इन द एब्सॉर्प्शन ऑफ विटामिन डी एंड कैल्शियम आई इन इंटरफियर और इनहिबिट द मेटाबोलिज्म ऑफ बी ट्वेल्व दैट लीड्स टू द एनीमिया एंड न्यूरोपैथी सो वट वी रिमेंबर वी रिमेंबर द टॉक्सिसिटी ऑफ द फिनाइटोन बाय रिमेंबरिंग बाय बाय नेम इट सेल्फ राइट सो इफ यू बीन आस्क के हिस्सुटिज्म इज द एडवर्स इफेक्ट ऑफ विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग ड्रग हिस्सुटिज्म there is an another drug which also causes the hirsutism or which is also called as hypertrichosis do you remember the name of that drug the answer is minoxidil that is a vasodilator minoxidil it causes the hypertrichosis hypertrichosis means what the increase is the hair growth minoxidil hypertrichosis or you are also also called as hirsutism so that increases the excessive hair growth right so minoxidil is also having this property Okay, what is the? We have the one prodrug for the phenytoin that is a phosphenytoin, which is a water soluble prodrug. And what is the advantage of this? That it is easy to administer through the IV because the phenytoin itself is having the low water solubility, and because of that, the IV in we have the phenytoin injections available, but we cannot go beyond certain concentration. So, if we want to administer the higher concentration of phenytoin through the IV. it would not be possible and that is the reason why we, why this phosphenytoin is being synthesized phosphenytoin is a water soluble pro drug of the phenytoin and we can give the large quantity of uh, phenytoin through this right so we have the we have the what is the advantage another the advantage is we can give it through the faster speed yes but the thing is when you are giving this uh, sodium channel blocker through this uh, fast speed or oh, you always need to monitor the ecg right that could that could alter the ecg and that is why we need to monitor it so that is about the phenytoin let's come to the valproate valproate what is what you need to remember here in the valproate the valproate here the biggest problem with the valproate is a gi upset gi upset abdominal cramp and nausea and vomiting that's the biggest problem with it other another problem hypertoxicity it is a teratogenic it also causes a weight gain so these are very specific adverse effect associated with the valproate and we have the one valproate uh, we have the one pro drug available here which is not actually a pro drug but it's a combination of the valproate with the valproic acid that is known as divalproex what is this divalproex means what divalproex means it's a combination of valproic acid with the sodium valproate in a ratio of 1 gem 1 what is the advantage of this divalproex the advantage is the gi tolerance is better and that is why the gi side effect is less in the divalproex so if someone ask you or if your question is ki what is the advantage of divalproex over the valproate what you can answer there you can answer the divalproex is having the better gi tolerance compared to the valproate so that would be easy right that would be easy okay next the next is the next is carbamazepine carbamazepin yes it is an inducer of cymp enzyme and this cymp enzymes are 23a4 and 2c9 what is the problem with this this is interfering with the concentration of the t4 that is a thyroxin so that is interfering with the thyroid functioning so if you been asked which anti epileptic drug is interfering with the thyroxin functioning the answer is what the answer is carbamazepine right if your question is if your question is which anti epileptic drug is interfering with the thyroid hormone function the answer is what the answer is carbamazepine so it's easy uh, the ocular toxicity is also being produced hepatotoxicity is also there osteomalacia is produced leukopenia is there what is the we have the another congener that is actually not a pro drug that is a congener or it is also called as an analog analog of carbamazepine which is known as ox carbamazepine what is the advantage of ox carbamazepine the ox carbamazepine is having the advantage of less cyp interaction so it's a weak inducer so the drug drug interaction is less yes the risk of hepatotoxicity is less but the only problem is what when it is being given the chances of the getting hyponatremia the risk is more hyponatremia the risk of hyponatremia is more with the ox carbamazepine compared to compared to carbamazepine 
so this is this is the thing right so this this is all about the epilepsy we've done about the epilepsy now let's come to the come to the psychosis so we are going to see about the psychosis and the parkinson and the psychosis and the parkinson this dopamine pathways are very important if you understand the concept it would be very easy to understand these two chapters because these both chapters are exact opposite to each other parkinsonism parkinsonism is a situation which is characterized by the decrease in the dopamine inside the brain and specifically inside the nigrostriatal pathway so parkinsonism is characterized by the decrease in the dopamine in the nigrostriatal pathway while the psychosis is characterized by the increase in the level of dopamine so these both diseases are opposite to each other these both conditions are opposite to each other and that is why this both topic you have to understand and read simultaneously or with together what you need to remember you need to remember but the psychosis and parkinsonism are opposite to each other because psychosis is caused due to the excessive amount of dopamine inside the brain and parkinsonism is caused due to the deficiency of dopamine but let's see where exact the deficiency of dopamine occurs or where the exact the excess amount of dopamine occurs leading to the psychosis or the parkinson so let's see and let us understand this four pathways so these are the four pathways mesolimbic mesocortical nigrostriatal and tuberoinfundibular which are the four pathways mesolimbic that is from midbrain to the limbic system midbrain to the limbic system mesocortical that is from midbrain to the cortex nigrostriatal that is from substantia nigra to the corpus striatum and tuberoinfundibular which is from hypothalamus to the pituitary gland see here in this hypothalamus to the pituitary gland it is running between the endocrine glands right hypothalamus is also having the endocrine function pituitary gland is also having the endocrine function so here it means what the tuberoinfundibular pathway that is associated with the some hormonal function and yes and this is the function when the when the d2 receptor activity is reduced in this pathway that causes the increase in the prolactin leading to the galactoria into the female and gynecomastia into the male gynecomastia means what it's a development of the breast inside the male so breast development occurs inside the male called as gynecomastia so what you are remembering here there are four pathways the first two pathways these are the two pathways where the increase in the d2 receptor that causes the psychosis in the second pathway the decrease in the dopamine one see dopamine and dopamine d1 and d2 receptor they are opposite natured receptor d2 right d2 and d1 they are opposite receptor but ultimately ultimately the thing is what the thing is these are the receptors are being involved so why why i am focusing on the receptors the reason is what okay, when you understand this receptor or remember this receptor so you remembering the drug would be easy for you this is why i have mentioned the receptors here also the see d1 d1 receptor activity is reduced and the 5 ht 2a receptor activity is increased and that is leading to the psychosis and which symptoms are occurred psychosis having the three types of the symptoms positive negative and cognitive so the first pathway is associated with the positive symptom which include the hallucination and delusion so if someone is having this type of symptom you can understand that this pathway is involved and you can give the drug which is a d2 receptor antagonist so that would be very easy for us to understand the situation right if someone is representing the positive symptoms then you can understand okay this positive symptoms occurred because of mesolimbic pathway and where the dopamine 2 receptor activity is increased so it means i have to give the d2 antagonist so d2 antagonist easy to treat number one meso mesocortical mesocortical this is a pathway which is involved for the negative and cognitive symptoms if someone is having the some negative symptoms like social isolation or having some suicidal thoughts and uns having the cognitive symptoms like uh, memory loss so in that case the role of the 5 ht 2a receptor is more where the 5 ht 2a receptor activity is increased so here we will give the drug which is inhibiting this activity right so that is a second generation we will see the classification in the later stage but uh, this role this receptor is involved here so remember the receptors and remember the symptoms okay, which symptoms are associated with the which receptor so it will be easy to remember the mechanism of that cat drugs right 
नंबर थ्री नंबर थ्री इज अ नाइग्रोस्ट्रिएटल एंड दैट इज वेयर द डोपामिन टू रिसेप्टर एक्टिविटी इज रिड्यूज दिस इज एक्जेक्टली ऑपोजिट टू दैट ऑफ द मेजोलिम्बिक पाथवे mesolimbic pathway where the need to activity is increased that leads to the positive symptoms while in third pathway nigrostriatal pathway d2 activity is reduced that leads to the parkinsonism symptom right so this is very important this is the pathways of the dopamine and based on that we have the treatment so uh, as we discussed the first generation here here let's say here we have the first generation antipsychotic drug or you can call it as a typical antipsychotics these are the drugs which is having a prominent d2 receptor antagonistic effect but this drug they are they are very non specific it, it means what it means they could not target the particular pathway it can inhibit the d2 receptor everywhere in the inside the brain and because of that it can inhibit the d2 receptor that can inhibit the d2 receptor into the nigrostriatal into the nigrostriatal pathway as well as that can inhibit the d2 receptor into the tubero infundibular pathway as well tubero infundibular pathway yes so because of this it leads to the toxicity see nigrostriatal pathway in which the d2 receptor inhibition causes the symptoms of parkinsonism which is called as extra pyramidal symptoms so parkinsonism symptoms would occur because of this inhi inhibition in the nigrostriatal pathway while in the tubero infundibular pathway the inhibition of the d2 receptor that causes the increase in the secretion of prolactin because the dopamine and prolactin they are opposite to each other and prolactin is is having the inhibitory hormone which is known as dopamine so when the dopamine is inhibited prolactin get increase and that leads to the that leads to the galactoria galactoria into the female and gynecomastia into the male so easy to remember right easy to correlate yes so the first generation would have this toxicity which toxicity the patient would have the symptoms of parkinson the patient male patient have the gynecomastia female patient is having galactoria these are the toxicities or you can call it as an adverse effect okay we have the three categories of drug based on the potency clopromazine thiazidine is the lowest potency highest potency haloperidol flupanthixol these are the two common drug along with that they also have the some anticholinergic effect these drugs have the anticholinergic sedative property so and they have the anti emetic effect as well so clopromazine flupanthixol they can be also used as an anti emetic as well right so this this is a first generation the second generation which is also known as a typical antipsychotic and they have this specific effect on 5ht2a receptor along with that it is also having the possesses of the hd2 receptor antagonistic effect but this effect 5ht2a is more prominent here so this means what this means a typical antipsychotic they are more effective in the negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms while the first generation they are more effective into the into the positive symptoms of psychosis so this is what you correlate what we are correlating we have seen in the earlier pathway ki the the uh, the first pathway right where the mesolimbic pathway where d2 receptor is being involved and uh, that causes the psychosis and having the positive symptoms so here d2 receptor antagonists they can be used they can be used in this specific positive symptoms so typical they are more effective in in positive symptoms and uh, are typical they are more effective more effective into the negative and cognitive symptoms which are the examples here in a typical antipsychotic the examples are clozapine risperidone olanzapine quetiapine aripiprazole ziprasidone brexpiprazole paliperidone asenapine right asenapine is available through the sublingual route paliperidone is an active metabolite of risperidone so these are few things that you can remember here and it would be easy right and the chances of getting question from this topic would be high right so uh, so learn it okay just a moment ha huh? okay so this is about antipsychotic uh, let's see the common adverse effect as i told you uh, as i told you the first generation they having the prominent prominent d2 antagonistic effect along with that they have the anticholinergic side effect and because of that the constipation dry skin dry mouth may occur 
these extra pyramidal symptoms they are the side effects of the like parkinsonism symptoms and uh, dystonia and dystonia extra pyramidal side effect is a broader term which is including the dystonia akathisia parkinsonism and td that is tardive dyskinesia then uh, patient may have the hyperprolactinemia that is leading to the galactoria and gynecomastia sedation yes the hypotension qtc prolongation qt interval prolongation these are uh, qt interval prolongation is more common with the saloperidol so qt interval prolongation is more with the haloperidol so these are the symptoms or these are the toxicities or adverse effect which is found with the first generation first generation matlab typical right next a typical antipsychotic what could be the here also we have the drug which is having anticholinergic but the drug is only close up in so with the close up in it is it is uh, being produced uh, with the risperidone and paliperidone the hyperprolactinemia is observed with the metabolic adverse effect is specifically seen like the hyperglycemia that is specifically seen in this category only it was not present in the first generation so hyperglycemia hyperlipidemia these are the adverse effect that is being observed in the second generation or a typical antipsychotic only that would be less in the first generation qtc prolongation is also present but the only with the ziprasidone ziprasidone so this is about the antipsychotics now let's come to the next topic which is a parkinson what is parkinson so parkinson is a situation which is because of the neurodegenerative disease which is characterized by the total four symptoms and that can be remembered by remembering the acronym trap what are the trap tremor rigidity echinacea postural instability tremor means what tremor means involuntary contraction of small skeletal muscle rigidity stiffness of the muscle echinacea it is inability to initiate the skeletal muscle movement and postural instability inability to maintain the posture so these are the four major symptoms that is uh, that is occurred due to the neurodegeneration right but how this will occur so this is occurred because of the destruction of the dopaminergic neurons in this pathway what is that pathway that pathway is nigrostator pathway this is a third pathway right we will we learn it so this dopamine pathway if that is distracted or the activity of dopamine is reduced here that increases the cholinergic transmission and because of this these symptoms are appeared so what dopamine and acetylcholine they are opposite to each other if dopamine is reduced the acetylcholine transmission or cholinergic transmission is increased and because of this these symptoms are appeared so what you can do you can do by preventing or you can by by doing this thing so here there are two reasons right see destruction occurs yeah to feel the decrease in the dopamine occurs these are the two major reasons here the what you can do is you can increase the dopamine here that is a one target so what is the target the target is uh, you can increase the dopamine so that we can give the levodopa this is a precursor so by giving this drug the dopamine is uh, dopamine is increased and that is inhibiting this effect right so that can be a one solution number two we can prevent the destruction of this neurons by giving the uh by see the why, why these neurons are destructed the reason is what the reason is excitotoxicity you might have heard this word before excitotoxicity what is that excitotoxicity means neurons get over activated and what is the excited neurotransmitter the answer is glutamate in majority of neurons the uh, active neurotransmitter which is excited neurotransmitter is glutamate so when the excitotoxicity occurs glutamate activity is increased because of this the neurons get damaged right b and uh, which are the important receptor for the glutamate the answer is nmda and nmda is associated with the calcium channel so when whenever the nmda receptor activated it allows the calcium to get in and because of that excess calcium neurons get destroyed so here we can give the uh, give the drug which is blocking this uh, so we can give the nmda receptor antagonist here right so nmda receptor antagonist that can be given as a treatment here the another reason why the dopamine is get reduced the reason is what the reason is because of its excessive metabolism so if the comp compt is a catecholomethyl transferase and mao b that is a monoamine oxidase b this enzyme is get over activated that leads to the increase in the dopamine metabolism leading to the decrease in the dopamine inside the pathway and because of that the parkinson occurs so what we can do we can inhibit this 
COMT inhibitor. We can give inhibit uh, inhibit this mau B as well. So these are also the targets. So these are the few targets, and let's see the classification based on this. So the classification is we can we can increase the dopamine. So here we are going to see the drugs which is acting on the brain dopaminergic system, and what they do ultimately they increases the dopamine where in the nigrostriatal pathway. So and what will be the side effect of this? If if this dopamine is increased in the mesolimbic pathway, what would be the side effect? The side effect is the psychosis, right? Because excessive amount of dopamine inside the brain causes a psychosis. So the opposite ad adverse effect of this therapy would be the psychosis. So hallucination, delusion, right? The symptoms of the psychosis would occur as a toxicity or as a as a toxicity of these drugs. Okay, so which are the drugs acting on the dopaminergic system? We can give the dopamine precursor. Why we are not giving the dopamine itself? Because dopamine cannot crosses the blood brain barrier. While the levodopa is highly lipophilic, crosses the BBB, so we can give this. We can also give the peripheral dopa decarboxylase inhibitor to avoid the toxicity of levodopa into the peripheral system. So these two drugs, they are given in the combination. Because if you give the levodopa, and if you are not giving this dopa decarboxylase inhibitor, it means your peripheral organs can also produce the dopamine from the levodopa. And we don't need the dopamine in the peripheral organs. So to prevent this peripheral dopa decarboxylase, we can give the combination of uh, dopa decarboxylase inhibitor, which is a carbidopa and benzerazide, right? And remember this, they cannot cross the blood brain barrier. The reason is what? Because we are, we are just inhibiting the peripheral not central so that is why they cannot cross the middle of brain barrier so remember this that's a logic actually the next dopaminergic agonist we can give this drug which can enter into the brain and stimulate the receptors and these are the three drugs bromocryptin paropinirole and pramipexol then mau b inhibitor they are the selagin and rasagilin compt inhibitor entacapone tolcapone and nmda receptor antagonist which is an amantadine Amantadine is an antiviral drug. It is also the antiviral drug which is being used into the treatment of influenza. Influenza. This is uh, this amantadine is used in the influenza in treatment. Amantadine is also having the capability to release the dopamine inside the brain, and because of that, we can use it in a Parkinson disease. So these are the two dual effects: NMD antagonist as well as dopamine releasing effect. Okay, now here these are the drugs which is not acting on the dopaminergic system, but they are acting on the cholinergic system. We know that whenever the dopamine is get reduced, whenever the dopamine get reduced, that has a direct relation with the increase in the ACH effect. So what we will do is we are not giving a drug related to the dopamine, but we are targeting here, then that is a cholinergic inhibitors. So we can give the drugs which is acting as a central anticholinergic drug. We have the benzhexol and procyclid in there. We have the antihistaminic drug which is also possessing the anticholinergic effect and because of this anticholinergic effect we are giving this orphanadrine and promethazine. They are not being given because of its antihistamine property but they are being given because of its anticholinergic property. So they don't have, histamine does not have any role into it but this antihistamine they have the anticholinergic effect as well and because of this they are being used right you see. So this is about the Parkinson and uh, levodopa is the one of the most, most common drug which being given to the patient who is uh, having the age of more than 60, right? This is the most preferred drug. So levodopa, uh, what would be the adverse effect here? The adverse effects are the levodopa itself activating the dopamine receptor that causes the nausea and vomiting, right? So nausea and vomiting can occur. Uh, it dilates the blood vessels, so hypotension can occur, they can modify the taste, they can have the uh, dyskinesia occurs, so dyskinesia means it's an uncontrolled involuntary movement, what can be the solution? You can reduce the dose. The wearing off effect which is also known as endos effect that may turn into the on off effect, what is the solution? You can give the more frequent doses. I have seen the patient, I have seen the patient where the levodopa was given a 10 times a day. 10 times every every two and a half hour the drug was given so you can increase the frequency when you get the patient is having some on off effect or endos effect then in that case you can increase the frequency right more small doses more small doses of this levodopa can be given 
they can produce the toxicity of the liver by increasing the liver enzymes they can increase the frequency of urination and uh, abrupt withdrawal that can produces the parkinson hyperpyrexia syndrome so you cannot stop the levodopa immediately because it may produces the symptom what is that of uh, parkinson hyperpyrexia syndrome so which is characterized by the muscle rigidity muscle rigidity hyperthermia and altered consciousness so that is all about the uh, parkinson we have done about the parkinson now let's come to the depression see why the depression occurs the depression occurs because of the deficiency of the transmitters inside the brain which neurotransmitter is decreased so here you need to understand see whenever the brain is having the less amount of serotonin or less amount of norepinephrine or the less amount of dopamine where actually dopamine is having the less role in into it but the major role is of what major role is of 5ht and noradrenaline whenever this two neurotransmitter is get depleted that leads to the patient is having the symptoms of depression so patient is having the depression symptoms when when the 5ht or norepinephrine is get reduced inside the brain so this is a, this is the reason why the depression occurs so what can be the solution the solution is what the solution is anyhow you have to increase the amount of 5ht or noradrenaline inside the brain so if you if your drug increases the level of serotonin and increases the level of norepinephrine inside the brain that can be used successfully for the treatment of depression so the most important category which we use in a treatment is a ssri what is that ssri is a selective serotonin serotonin we all know serotonin is 5ht so this is a category which is inhibiting the reuptake and thereby they increases the level of serotonin inside the brain which are the drugs we have the six drugs available in this category fluoxetine fluvoxamine the paroxetine sertraline citalopram acetalopram these are the six drugs available in this category and this category is always a first choice of therapy in the treatment of depression so this is a first choice huh? remember this ssri is a first choice of treatment in the depression ssri selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor remember the all the names right we don't have any common suffix or prefix here to remember the name of the drugs we have the six drugs av available here next second category is snri snri means what selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor where we have the two drugs here the venlafaxine and duloxetine we have the uh, another pro drug miss pro drug of this venlafaxine is also available that is desvenlafaxine so we have the three drugs here venlafaxine desvenlafaxine and duloxetine the next mao a inhibitor see here we mention mao a but in parkinsonism we mention mao b so remember this this is a some difference mao b mao b which is involved in the metabolism of dopamine while mao a it is involved in the metabolism of serotonin and norepinephrine so this is some basic difference you can remember mao a that is monoamine monoamine oxidase a this is involved in the metabolism of serotonin and norepinephrine so here mao a inhibitor is being used mao a inhibitor mao inhibitor where where being they are being used they are being used in depression or mao b inhibitor where they are being used they are being used in the parkinsonism so mao b in parkinsonism mao a inside the inside the inside the depression okay which are the examples of mao b inhibitor there was salicylin and rafagilin which are mao inhibitors moclobemide and chlorgylin moclobemide moclobemide and chlorgylin okay so this is how you can remember okay next tca tca is a tricyclic antidepressant we have the two sub categories based on the neurotransmitters involved so if a drug is inhibiting the reuptake of both noradrenaline and 5ht the example are imipramine amitriptyline clomipramine doxepine while if predominantly it is norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor then the metabolite of imipramine is a disipramine am amitriptyline metabolite jo hai wo hai nortriptyline so these are the drugs nortriptyline is safest into the elderly patient if you want to give the give the patient tca right if you want to administer the tca into the elderly patient then nortriptyline is one of the base molecule having the less anticholinergic side effects right so that is the reason why it is being preferred into the elderly patient so if you been given 
कि विच विच ड्रग इज बींग गिवन इन टू द पेशेंट हु इज हैविंग द एज ऑफ सिक्सटी फाइव एंड ऑप्शन आर बींग गिवन लाइक एमी ट्रिप्टिलीन एंड नॉट ट्रिप्टिलीन यू ऑलवेज प्रीफर दिस नॉट ट्रिप्टिलीन एज अ प्रायोरिटी हैविंग लेस एंटी कोलिनर्जिक इफेक्ट राइट दैट इज वॉट एडवांटेज इज ओके नेक्स्ट अ टिपिकल अ टिपिकल मीन्स वी हैव द फ्यू ड्रग्स विच इज नॉट विच इज नॉट नॉट getting set with this above categories and that is why they kept into the different category called as atypical like bupropion bupropion mirtazepine trazodone mianserin bupropion is the one which is also being used into the smoking cessation yes bupropion smoking cessation and actually the smoking cessation the main drug is varenicline varenicline is the one which is being most widely used and uh, bupropion is the another one that can be used mirtazepine trazodone mianserin atomoxetin atomoxetin is also being used into the treatment of adhd attention deficit hyperactivity disorder adhd right adhd so this this is few things this is all about the depression we see the adverse effects of the ssri ssri is one of the most important category is a first line drugs for the treatment of depression so let's see few specific adverse effect of the individual drugs so if someone ask you which uh, see all the all the ssri or all, all all the anti depression they have the some degree of sexual dysfunction but the most sexual dysfunction is found with the with the sertraline so which drug is having the sexual dysfunction more in amount than the sertraline right sertraline suicidal ideation more with the venlafaxine and mirtazepine qtc prolongation more with the citalopram acetalopram weight gain is more with the paroxetine and mirtazepine risk factor is found with the with the ssri gi bleeding is found with the most with the fluoxetine nausea with the fluoxetine and paroxetine anorexia with the fluoxetine diarrhea with the sertraline constipation with the fluoxetine they are very specific adverse effect related to the particular drug so major drugs you can remember here let's see which one you need to remember these are all and all adverse effect mentioned here but the mes- maximum that you can or the mo- most important that you can remember here is about sexual dysfunction suicidal ideation this yes which is mo- this is not actually the ssri but uh, here it is having the having the most suicidal ideation ideation tendency so that is why the snri have mentioned here even this metazepine is also not belonging to the ssri but i mentioned the the suicidal addition is more with these two drugs and that is why it is not even in ssri even though i mentioned here right so just remember it then weight gain yes weight gain is also important qtc prolongation is more important so whatever i i've just star mark you have to remember this uh, while remaining everything that you can skip even gi bleeding that is also good uh, that is all okay uh, anticholinergic side effects are more with the paroxetine cia that is found with the almost a, each and every ssri belonging to this category so that is all so these are star mark right sexual dysfunction suicidal ideation qtc prolongation weight gain gi bleeding then uh, then the anticholinergic side effects so these are the few star mark question that you can remember that can be helpful for getting the right answer in in gpet okay next next disease is what alzheimer alzheimer disease you might have learned about it and you might have seen so many bollywood and hollywood movies where the patient is having this symptoms alzheimer alzheimer is a specific name that is being given to the patient when when the patient is having the memory loss right alzheimer disease is characterized by this particular symptom called as dementia 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 means memory loss why this dementia occurs because the 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 brain is having the role uh, or if you say the memory can be stored in this region which region which neurons the cholinergic neurons they are hap- they are involved into the storing the memory so what is the role of cholinergic neuron cholinergic neurons are involved in storing the memory cholinergic neurons are involved in storing the memory so when this cholinergic neurons when this cholinergic neurons are destroyed or the activity of this cholinergic neuron is decreased right like someone is getting the less amount of ach in the brain so it means what it means if less ach is there it means the transmission is delayed and because of the patient could not work patient could not recall the memory and that is why the dementia occurs so alzheimer disease it will occur because of the deficiency of ach inside the brain or the less amount of cholinergic neurons inside the brain leading to the memory loss 
so what why this thing is happening let's see suppose if we call it as like the less ach why the less ach occurs it is because of that may be the reason that high amount of choline acid is there and because of that the ach get metabolized and that is why the amount of ach get reduced and that is the reason so what we can do is we can give a drug which inhibit the metabolism of ACH and that would be the first category of drug and there's a main category of drug and these are all molecules that can crosses the BBB right these all are the lipophilic molecules donepezil, rivastigmine, galentamine these all are molecules they can crosses the blood brain barrier inhibit this enzyme and that is why the metabolism of ACH is inhibited right yeah we there are few other molecules like uh, Cholinesterase inhibitor like physostigmine, neostigmine, pyridostigmine, who cannot cross the blood brain barrier, and that is the reason why we cannot use it into the parking in, into the Alzheimer. Why you cannot use into the Alzheimer? Why neostigmine is not given into the treatment of Alzheimer? Because they are peripherally acting drug, they cannot cross the blood brain barrier, and if the blood brain barrier is not crossed, it means they cannot be used in that condition, right? So cholinesterase inhibitor. These all three molecules that I mentioned, they can cross the blood brain barrier. They pass through this and because of that, they work. So that's a first choice, first choice in the treatment of Alzheimer. Okay, what would be the second reason? The second reason is the excitotoxicity that can causes the increase in the glutamate activity leading to the destruction. So what we can do? We can prevent the glutamate toxicity by giving the NMDA receptor antagonist. We mentioned that the amantadine is a drug. Amantadine is also having the dual property, like right? it increases the dopamine release as well. And that is why we, we are using that drug particularly in the treatment of Parkinson. But here, uh, the memantin is being preferred. Memantin is an also the NMDA receptor antagonist, which is having the FEC efficacy more towards the cholinergic neurons. And that is why we can use it. But that could not be the first choice that would be a second choice or that can be added into the cholinesterase inhibitor so if any patient who is having the problem with the memory the first category which is being prescribed is a cholinesterase re inhibitor and if that drug is not working or the efficiency is not observed with that category in that case to increase the efficiency memantin is get added so memantin is not a first priority the first priority is cholinesterase inhibitor and if the quality if if the drug is getting less effective in that case, we are adding this drug, Mamantin, to increase the efficiency, right? So, cholinesterase inhibitor is the first category and most important category. So, remember this name, Rivastigmine, Galentamine and Donepezil. Next is a NMD antagonist where Mamantin is being given. And we have the other nootropic agent. Nootropic means these are the drugs which enhance the memory. So, these are the memory enhancer drugs, right? Paracetam, nootropics, they are called as nootropics. Nootropics means what? Nootropics means these are the drugs which can enhance the memory. And this is Ginkgo biloba. Ginkgo biloba is a Chinese plant. This is a Chinese plant which is having this nootropic effect. Okay, someone, uh, there may be a probability they can ask you a question okay, which, uh, which Chinese plant is being given in the treatment of Alzheimer? Then you need to answer, okay, that's, that's a Ginkgo biloba. Ginkgo biloba is a Chinese plant that would be used in the treatment of Alzheimer. That is a memory enhancing property. So, yeah, remember it. Okay. Next, next chapter is opioid. So, here what I have done is I have made a table. Okay, which are the important characteristic of that particular opioids. So, number one, codeine. So, what you need to remember about codeine? Codeine is actually not being used as an opioid analgesic, but it is being used as an anti tussive agent, right? It is one of the best anti tussive drug available into the market. Anti tussive means what? Anti tussive means it's a used into the dry cuff. Codeine is used in the dry cuff, but it is having a problem of sedation, the tolerance, addiction. That would be a limitation with this. And that is the reason why the dextromethorphan is getting more used compared to this. So, antitussy, we have only two major drugs. What are they? The codeine and dextromethorphan. So, codeine is not actually being used as an analgesic, but yes, it can have the analgesic effect because codeine get metabolized into the morphine. And because of this morphine, it is having its analgesic effect, but we don't use generally. So, uh, so what is how it has been converted? So, name of the enzyme you need to remember here. So, which enzyme converts the codeine into the morphine? The answer is what? CYP2D6. Which enzyme converts the codeine into the morphine? 
the answer is c by p 2d6 so this is important for us right important for us okay next pethidine what is the pethidine so pethidine is having the anticholinergic effect the biggest problem with it the biggest adverse effect with the pethidine it is a convulsion and why this convulsion occurs because the pethidine would be converted into its metabolite called as norpethidine and this norpethidine is having the property to produce a scissor so itself itself pethidine itself is not itself is not a problem but when it is converted to the norpethidine which is a toxic metabolite converting producing the scissor norpethidine Okay. Then with the SSRI that increases the serotonin release and that is why the serotonin syndrome can occur that would be a specific interaction. So those drugs suppose pethidine is being given along with along with the 5-HT agonist right suppose someone has been given with the 5-HT agonist like a sumatriptan. So in that case in that case this both drug increases the efficiency of serotonin and that is why the serotonin syndrome can occur that would be a side effect right. So so this uh, with the SSRI as well. So 5-HT agonists or SSRI, those drugs which increases the serotonin that all can produce us. Methadone, what is the problem with methadone? So methadone is uh, having the actually uh, advantage. What the advantage is? It is having the less or mild withdrawal symptoms. So those who get problem with the opioid withdrawal, in that case methadone can be given. Right. The reason is what? Because the tolerance and dependence is less compared to the morphine. So that is why it is being given as a substitution therapy in the opioid dependent patient. So someone who is who is using the opioid since long and uh, we you cannot withdraw the opioid in that patient. So in that case, we can substitute the opioid with the methadone and then slowly we will stop it. Right. If someone is on a morphine since three years, if you stop the morphine immediately, that would produce a severe withdrawal symptom. So you cannot stop the morphine all of a sudden. What you can do, you have to substitute the morphine with the methadone and then you can slowly stop the methadone. So methadone would not have a problem of the dependence, right? So in that case, that would be the advantage of it. Tramadol. Tramadol is, uh, is a very widely used drug from the synthetic category. It is available in the combination with the paracetamol 325 milligram. Uh, with the serotonin reuptake inhibitors that also produces the serotonin syndrome. Yes, it is a longest acting drug and uh, having less effect on the blood pressure. Next, fentanyl. Fentanyl is the most potent opioid. So if you want to remember about the fentanyl, it's a most potent. And it is, yes, of course, it is available into the patches. It's the most potent, right? Then next, buprenorphine. Buprenorphine means it is having a less withdrawal effect. So, uh, methadone, those who have a problem with the methadone, you can use along with the buprenorphine plus naltrexone. So, that combination can be used. Uh, here, the problem is what? Hypotension is a problem. Pentajosin. Pentajosin, yes, the biggest problem here is a tachycardia and hypertension. So, heart rate is get increased and blood pressure get increased in this drug. That would be a problem. Uh, Butorphenol, the yes, cardiac stimulation again cardiac stimulation so heart rate get increased but there is but there would be less effect into the blood pressure opioid antagonist we have the three opioid antagonists so someone who is having the opioids and getting the again get the toxicity with it then these are the three solutions but the best preferred molecule is naloxone right why naloxone because it is having the immediate effect that is given through the iv or if you are not suppose uh, you are on a store you are on a pharmacy store and some patient get uh, toxicity of the opioid and uh, you don't know the iv route of administration then you can also inject through the im as well so you can you can inject the uh, naloxone im as well so uh, its most preferable route is the intravenous to get the immediate effect but im can also be given naloxone is not available into the orally because uh, because of its high first pass metabolism and it's a main drug as an opioid antagonist we use this then next naltrexone what is the advantage here is naltrexone can be available orally so naltrexone only one advantage that is uh, that is it can be given orally naltrexone is also having the another indication that we have all, all already understood that it reduces the craving for alcohol and we can use it into the treatment of chronic alcoholism next methyl naltrexone methyl naltrexone that is a methylated form what's the problem 
see here with the naltrexone the biggest problem is the is a uh, uh, so here with the methyl naltrexone because of it has a peripheral action on the git and uh, that is why we can also used for the uh, treatment of constipation right someone has got the someone has got the uh, the constipation due to the opioid use then in that case methyl naltrexone can be useful because of its peripheral effect uh, we all know like codeine codeinia all the other opioids which act on the git they decreases the motility and because of the constipation of course so constipation would be the would be the peripheral uh, adverse effect of the opioids so to avoid that toxicity or to avoid that constipation side effect or to treat that constipation we can use the methyl naltrexone so methyl naltrexone it is used to treat the constipation which occurred due to the overuse of opioid so opioid overused which leads to the constipation in that case we can use the methyl naltrexone okay nalmifen what is nalmifen nalmifen is also available intravenous the only advantage is having the longer duration so that is all about the opioid uh, this is the last slide i think and that is cna stimulant cna stimulant itself is a very small topic but here we need to remember a few drugs see what how can you get this cns get stimulated see depression and stimulation they are opposite to each other what we understood is whenever the depression occurs their amount of norepinephrine and 5-ht inside the brain get reduced so if this amount get increased inside the brain that causes the stimulation so all the drugs which causes the cns stimulation they all increases the level of dopamine noradrenaline 5-ht inside the brain and that is how the cns stimulant effect is being observed so they are where they are being used this cns stimulant they are being used in the treatment of adhd where they are can be used they can be used in a treatment of adhd this is a condition and which are the examples amphetamine dextroamphetamine and methylphenidate and out of this three molecule methylphenidate is most widely used agent if you want to give the priority right which molecule would be given a first priority for treating the of adhd then for that case methyl phenidate would be the first preferred molecule having the less effect onto the children see the adhd attention deficit hyperactivity disorder this is a common disease that occur or found into the children that is most common in the children where they could not focus on only one thing they can have the uh, right attention deficit means they cannot keep the attention and uh, and in this can in this case the cns stimulant can be a pre treatment for treat, uh, for this purpose right so the amphetamine and dextroamphetamine they also have this effect but they can impair the growth of the children while methylphenidate is having the less impact on the children growth and because of that it is given up first priority so if you if if someone is found with the or or found with the adhd and you have the three drugs you always have to choose methylphenidate first so that is the condition other thing is we have the one anti depression drug which is called as atomoxetine that can also be used in the treatment of adhd right atomoxetine that you can use uh, you we can have the another drug called as modafinil modafinil is a psychostimulant that will be used specifically in this situation of narcolepsy narcolepsy means what narcolepsy means daytime sleepiness right daytime sleepiness someone is sleep uh, they are get this, they get the sleepiness during the day active during the daytime so that daytime sleepiness is called as narcolepsy and another one those who work in this shift right the two days in a night and two days in a general shift and two days in a in a different shift so when the timing of the job is not fixed they work in the shift so for that patient also shift work disorder in that case also the modafinil can be given so remember the name modafinil where they are being used modafinil is being used in the treatment of narcolepsy and shift work sleep disorder okay other we have another drug called as doxapram what is that doxapram is an analeptic it stimulates the respiratory center and can be given to the patient who get unconscious or the respiration has got decreased right so is a is a respiratory stimulant so someone uh, you may have, you may be asked a question can okay, identify the analeptic drug from below given list then doxapram is the right one right analeptic analeptic is also known as 
respiratory stimulant so that is all about the cns stimulant oh that's last slide i think i'm so sorry uh, that is centrally acting muscle relaxant centrally acting muscle relaxant we have the so many drugs so i just keep the classification based on the mechanism that benzodiazepine receptor agonist we have the benzodiazepines inhibition of the spinal interneurons we have the methocarbamol and chlorosuccasone uh, gaba b receptor see here we don't have the gaba a it's a gaba b gaba b receptor agonist that is baclofen then gaba mimetic we have gaba pentin thiocolchicoside these uh, inhibit the glutamate release that is reluzole the central alpha 2 receptor agonist which is a tizanidine so these all are the drugs which is acting centrally and uh, they are being used as a muscle relaxant so do the classification based on their mechanism right i've told you whatever whenever you are whenever you are skipping the topic at least you should do the classification with its mechanism so that would 100% help you out so that is all guys uh, i so many post on the instagram e you just refer this post this will 100% help you out to cover the important points related to your gpet and i'm damn sure you would be benefited so take this so just go through the instagram account read all the post right once you read all the post and you will 100% be get benefited so that is my contact id right you know my name that's nilesh kanjaria and this is my email id if you want to ask any question you can you can email me right that is we have the few paid courses available on my another application which is the work pharma application work pharma education it is available on the google play store uh, so that's on a google play store that you can get it from that all the content that i've taken it is from the kdt only right this is the only source i'm using so that is all uh, that is all for this topic uh, on the next day uh, we are going to take uh, the lecture on the ans drugs acting on ans so that that topic is also important right so that we will take on uh, on the next day 10 pm onwards so thank you guys i hope you learn something from this topic and uh, if you get any queries just let me know into the comment or you can you can you can also call me anytime don't worry thank you so much guys uh, so that is all